Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, last year, I was doing one of these presentations, and my granddaughter, who was two at the time, I was telling her that I was going to be doing a presentation, and in her two-year-old uh, wisdom, she said, don't break your leg. <laughs> Where did that come from? How does a two-year-old know to say that? So anyway, it's funny, I was talking with uh, Tammy this morning, and she said, don't break a leg, and it reminded me of, of what my granddaughter said, so I'm going to try really hard, y'all, to not break my leg, but if I do, somebody help me. Can somebody help me out? Okay, oh, thank you. Thanks, Greg. All righty. Well, welcome, everybody. It's so good to have you all here this morning to talk about emotional intelligence. Who likes to talk about emotional intelligence and their feelings and everything? Oh, like, yeah. Okay. All right. We've got a brave soul up here. That's good. Well, before we dive in, I came across this um, on LinkedIn last week, and I thought, wow, that really does sum up what we're trying to, to do when we are talking about skill development and personal development, particularly emotional intelligence. So I'm going to read this to you guys. This is by Young Pueblo. Every time someone loves themselves better, builds their self-awareness, understands their patterns, improves their ability to communicate, and expands their compassion for others, the future of humanity grows brighter. Your healing impacts the world by bringing in new peace. Just take a moment and let that settle in. When you are helping yourself, you're not just helping yourself. You're helping other people too. You do make a difference. What you do is impacting somebody in some way, whether negative, negatively or positively. So just let that settle in this morning as we talk about emotional intelligence. So let's just dive right in and get personal right off the bat. Who's lost it in here before? All right. You don't have to share, but what happened? I mean, I've got stories to tell y'all. I can tell some doozies. I'm not going to tell too much on myself this morning. But think about just the last time that you lost it. Okay, just go there for just a second. I want you to think about what happened. Just break it down for a second, okay? The last time I lost it was, I think, at 1 o'clock this morning <laughs> when I couldn't sleep, okay? And uh, the, the wind was whipping, and we have a tree that we needed trimmed this last fall. It just didn't work out for whatever reason. And so the tree, tree kept banging against our bedroom window and waking me up and scaring me. And I finally just got up. I'm like, of all nights for this to happen. So that's the last time that I kind of lost it, and I was by myself. My husband was asleep, so, you know, just the cats woke up to see what the crazy lady was doing. But that's what happened with me. But think about what happened. What triggered you? What was your response? What did you do? What was the fallout of that or the impact of that? Okay? See how easy it is just to kind of break down things that, that we've done? So... Are there any scientists or doctors in the room? Thank the good Lord. I am not a scientist. <laughs> I am not a doctor, okay? All right, so, whoo! So I'm going to explain you got, to you guys something that goes on in your brain whenever you are emotionally triggered by something, okay? So I have read extensively about this and stayed up to date, so I, I kind of know a little bit about what I'm talking about, but just like this much. Enough to tell you guys the science of what's going on whenever your amygdala hijacks your emotions, okay? So this beautiful picture is your brain, okay? And this part right here of your brain we have your upstairs brain, okay? And I want you to think like right here, your frontal cortex, okay? That's your upstairs brain. And then we have your downstairs brain. So your thinking brain is your upstairs brain, okay? And your emotional brain is your downstairs brain. So when you are having an emotional event, here's what's ha here is what happens. So your amygdala right here this weird little yellow circle lives right in the center of your brain your amygdala is what gets triggered so it sends off a trigger and that goes to your hypothalamus does anyone know what happens in your hypothalamus 
that's where your fight or flight occurs, okay? So your hypothalamus goes, well, what are we going to do here? Are we going to run from this? <coughs> Is it a fire? Do we need to get out of here? Or are we going to stand and fight? What are we going to do? So your hypothalamus uh, begins to make that decision, and then your hippocampus actually says, well, here's what you did last time. So it stores the memory of how you reacted last time to that emotional event. Okay, so that's everything that's going on whenever you are emotionally triggered. Does that make sense? Okay. So, here's something really cool. You can actually train your brain to slow down an emotional trigger and give yourself enough time for your reaction to be processed up to your frontal cortex, your thinking brain. It takes six seconds for the amygdala to process from the amygdala, the emotional brain, to the frontal cortex whenever we have an emotional trigger. So when you are triggered, if you will just pause and count to six. One, two, three, four, five, six. It takes that long, that quick, to give your brain enough time for that trigger to go up here to the more reasonable part of your brain to say, okay, I'm not going to shout, I'm not going to have a fit. All the many things that we can do when we're emotionally triggered, okay, that would impact us negatively and other people. It just takes six seconds. With time and practice, we can train our brains to think more rationally than emotionally. I want you guys to think about somebody that you know that is a fairly calm person and, and they, they stay calm under pressure. Can you all think of somebody? Okay, that person has either practiced this with knowledge or they just naturally do it. They naturally have that pause. But it doesn't matter where you're at in life, what your personality is, what your behaviors are, we can all learn to do this and just take that pause. Now, I'm a very practical person. I'm a realist, okay? So I'm like, how do we put that in reality? What does that look like? Like if I start pausing every time I'm emotionally triggered, what am I gonna look like? What am I gonna say? Well, here's what you're not gonna do if you're emotionally triggered. If somebody emotionally triggers you, you're not gonna say, I'm emotionally triggered right now. <laughs> I'm gonna take a six second pause. <laughs> and then I'll decide how I'm gonna respond. <laughs> no, we're not gonna do that, right? No. So here's how I do it. If I feel triggered, uh, particularly in a conversation, a meeting, you know, whatever it might be, and somebody's looking for a response from me, okay, if I need to respond to whatever was just delivered to me, I, I will pause and I will just let that person know, hey, I need to think about this for just a second. So you might see my brain, you know, can see that my brain's working here, uh, but I just, need, I just need to pause on this and give it some thought before I deliver my answer. Did that sound weird? No. And then sometimes we need more time to think about stuff, right? Give yourself that time. If the situation allows for it, don't feel like you have to be Johnny on the spot with your response. Just say, I'm going to need a day or two to think about this. You know, I want to give you the best answer that I can. So just give me some time. Can you give me some time? And we'll, we'll round back up on this. Did that sound weird? Okay. So see, we can deal with our emotions and not sound freakish about it, right? We can have those good responses. So... I want you guys to think about that the next time you're emotionally triggered. It could be when you were walking out the door today. I want you to think the first thing is just pause. Just give it a pause. Even if you don't react the way that you would prefer to, just start practicing. Any questions on that? All right, so our agenda today. Did everybody get a handout, first of all? All righty. So we're going to be doing uh, some self-reflection today as we go through this presentation.
and then we're also going to have some group discussions. I encourage you all, please ask questions, make comments as we go. I don't like to be a talking head. I want it to be a conversation. So feel free to jump in um, anywhere during this presentation. So we're going to talk about what emotional intelligence is, or EQ, which stands for your emotional quotient, okay? Uh, and the five components of EQ. We're going to talk about the side effects of emotional intelligence, why it's important, the practical applications of emotional intelligence, particularly in the workplace. Things that you can consider start doing, stop doing, keep doing, and things that you can consider changing. And then we'll have some closing thoughts. All right? So, one of my favorite leadership tools that, that I teach uh, through Giant Worldwide is the Know Yourself to Lead Yourself tool. Has anyone in this room seen this tool, heard me speak about it before? Okay, a couple of you all have. Okay, so the first step in emotional intelligence, and really I think with any area of growth in your life, is to be self-aware. It all starts with you, right? And so if we can begin to know ourselves better so that we can lead ourselves better, then we can begin to make emotionally intelligent decisions. So know yourself to lead yourself. So what does this mean? Well, let me walk you through this tool. So you can see here that this is an infinity loop, okay? And then we have know yourself to lead yourself because you should always be working on yourself and developing, right? We can all improve, is that, is that right? Can we agree on that? Okay, so this is how this tool works. We all have tendencies. We have good tendencies and we have negative tendencies. You can use this tool for good tendencies, but you can really develop and grow using your negative tendencies. Our tendencies lead to patterns, patterns lead to actions, actions lead to consequences, and consequences alter our reality and other people's reality. So what does this mean in real life? Well, I will pick on myself and give you all an example. The first tendency that I started working on when I started using this tool a couple years ago is that I have a tendency when I feel strongly about something that I need to speak up about it. And I need to speak up right then. You know, I get emotionally triggered. And so I got to speak up right then. And I have to speak with passion and authority. Can you imagine how that comes across sometimes? whenever I do that. And so that was my tendency. And so my pattern was, yeah, you have to say this right now because you believe in it so strongly. and You have to say it with that passion and that authority and that sharpness and tone. So that would be my action. Anybody want to guess what some consequences were with me doing that? Yeah. Yeah. What else? Definitely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I threw people off sometimes because I went from just talking like this to all of a sudden I was so passionate and people were like, what is she doing? Like she just, you know, hit me upside the head. And so I threw people, I would throw people off. I would sometimes offend people. Sometimes I knew that. Other times I didn't know that. Okay. Maybe I ran into that person a few months later and they didn't speak to me. And I thought, oh no, what did I do? What have I done? Looking back, it was probably that. So those were the consequences. And then my reality was I was damaging relationships. Okay. I was having to sometimes go back and do some cleanup. It was very humbling <laughs> in a lot of ways. And it caused me a lot more work to do too. It took away from other things that I could be doing because I had cleanup work that I had to do. So Here's how I have used, and I am still using this tool to manage, and this is just one tendency of many, y'all, that I manage. So here is where the change occurs, right here where the pattern is. That's why we have these dotted lines. So my tendency to speak up, sharpness of tone, all that when I feel strongly about something, the pattern I've changed is I pause. Why am I pausing? Yeah, giving my brain time. And so I have been teaching myself to <coughs> pause and I ask myself a question. Does this need to be said? Is this just all about you, Melissa? Or is this positively going to impact this conversation? 
If the answer is no, this really is just about you. You don't need to say it. I don't say anything. So there's no action, no consequences, or altered reality. If the answer is, yeah, you know what? You really do need to say this, okay? I back off that tone. And I talk just like I'm talking now. People don't need to know, oh, she feels really strongly about this. Yeah, they don't need to know all that emotion behind it. So I back off that tone and guess what has happened? So I speak like I'm speaking now. People hear my words because before all they could see was just this Mack truck of emotion coming at them. But now they hear my words. Sometimes they're impactful. Sometimes they just pass on in the conversation and nothing happens and that's okay. But my reality is not altered in a negative way, neither is anyone else's, or sometimes I'm making an impact. So that's just one tendency that I use with this know yourself to lead yourself tool. All right? So you guys, feel free to use this tool. Uh, Amy will be emailing it to you. Every time I share it, I encourage people, put it on your desktop, keep it somewhere handy where you can use it. Begin managing your negative tendencies because we all have them, don't we? All right, any questions on that? So when we know ourselves to lead ourselves, guess what? We can begin to know ourselves to lead others too. Because we wanna make an impact in this world, don't we? You guys obviously care about who you are and what you're doing in life because you're here this morning to learn and grow and develop. So. We want to be able to lead others and have an impact on them. So we can begin to understand other people's behaviors, understand what their needs are, and help them along the way. And then we can also under know and understand how our behavior affects other people, which is a big part of having emotional intelligence. All right, any questions? Okay. So make sure you have your handout. Does everybody have their handout? So this is another tool that we use at Giant. So I want us to take just a couple minutes and respond and, and, respond and reflect to, on this. So this tool is called the leader mirror. So I want you to think that you're holding a mirror up, okay? And you're asking this really hard question. What is it like to be on the other side of me? If you really want to be brave, go ask somebody that knows you and somebody that you trust, okay? And that you could have a confidential conversation with and ask them, what's it like to be on the other side of me? All right, so that's the first question. The next question is, am I more reactive or proactive? Where are you at on that scale? Do you try to step out and get out in front of things or do you just let things happen to you? Do you say, here's the day, I'll just let it happen. Are you more reactive or proactive? Where are you at on that scale? And then, are you leading yourself intentionally? Or are you being accidental in life? Again, are you just letting life happen to you and you're just rolling with the punches and rolling through life and sometimes you are triggered and so you just respond however you wanna respond? Where are you at on the scale of being accidental and intentional? And then the last one is, are you inconsistent or consistent? And what I would say to this is, do people know what they're gonna get and who they're gonna get every time they interact with you? Are you somebody different every day? Okay, so are you inconsistent or are you consistent? So let's take two minutes, I'll put on the timer and I would like for you just with yourself, we'll have some other group discussions. I'd like for you to answer those questions. Do not stress out if you don't have an answer right now, okay? Just give yourself time. The answers might not come right here in two minutes. They might come later. Yes. Uh, so Denise, I think you raise a good question because a lot of times I get this in conversations when we are talking about 
personal development and skill development because a lot of it is very, sometimes it, it's, it's different between how we are at work versus how we are at home. And then sometimes it's very fluid for people. People are like, nope, I'm the same person everywhere I go. And other people are more like, well, at work, I have more, I do have more structure around me, right? Because your day is structured. You have a defined, most people have a defined work day and tasks they need to get done. So it kind of puts us in that place to be more structured. So no, that is a very normal response to say, well, I'm a little different at work than I am at home. You don't need special counseling. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Well, One thing that I can tell you is that when life is happening around you and things are out of your control, right, and things are inconsistent, one thing that you can begin to work on is consistency in your life. You can begin to work on how consistent you are at responding to the things that are happening around you. Absolutely. So it's just this cycle of... Yes. Guilt and shame and all that stuff. So let me just, let's, let's just pause here and talk about this for a second. So we also, there's an, another tool that we, we teach at, at Giant. Well, another strategy. When we do mess up, when we do blow up, and then all that guilt and shame comes, knock that off, okay? So here's what you're going to tell yourself the next time you mess up. You're going to say, you know what, I'm going to trade up, and we, we go like this, I'm going to trade up to better behavior. So I'm going to call myself up and not out. All right? So you're going to call yourself up to what you can do better next time and say, okay, I will try to do better next time. And you're going to, as best you can, and this takes work, y'all, this is, it takes a lot of work. You're going to say, I'm going to let go of the guilt and shame. Now, listen, own what you do. Be responsible. Don't just say, oh, I learned this new tool, so, you know, that's my home right now. No, be responsible for, for what you've done. But at the same time, let go of that guilt and that shame and say, I'm trading up to better behavior. And I'm going to call myself out and not up. Think of a child. Who, who, are, who, has, who has children in here? Okay. And, and who manages people in here? So just think about somebody you're, you, you're, you're managing or raising a child, and if they're learning and growing and developing, are you going to scream and shout at them whenever they mess up? I hope not, <laughs> okay? Probably not. You're probably going to encourage them, right? You're probably going to say, hey, here's what you can do next time. Be your own best friend. Talk to yourself like that too. All right. So you can be consistent in life, even when your world around you is inconsistent. You can, you can be that. All right. Near the end of this uh, workshop, we're going to respond to this and think of some actions that we can tie to what we've learned here. So tuck that in the back of your mind and we'll come back to this. So emotional intelligence, as I said already, is really understanding the needs and behaviors of other people too. It's not really all about us. It starts with us. It starts with us managing ourselves too, but then also understanding what other people are going through. So let's talk about the five limbic hijackers because it really is, emotional intelligence, it really is about managing our feelings when we're engaging with other people. So the limbic hijackers or triggers are fear. Is fear a bad thing? No. If someone came in here and yelled fire, what is the first thing we're all going to do? Move it? Yeah, hopefully not trample on each other trying to get out of the room, right? But we're going to get up and get out of this building. That is an appropriate response for fear. But sometimes we can begin, be, be fearful about things and let that fear really build up inside of us, right? What about getting up and talking in front of people? Some people have a big fear about that. It's not bad, but if they let it consume them, it can overtake them. So fear is not a bad thing, but we can make it a negative experience. Anger, guilt, sadness, 
and yes, even happiness. Can anyone think how happiness looks like when it hijacks our amygdala? Anyone ever laughed at a joke? Yeah, I don't have a good joke to tell this morning, but yeah, I mean, if you laugh at a joke, have you ever laughed at a joke like you laughed kind of too loud or just kind of to the point where you embarrassed yourself and you're like, oh my gosh. Yeah, so sometimes happiness can take over. I have this tendency that I actually realized many years ago that I had to kind of control is if I got real happy and excited about something, for some reason, things would come out of my mouth that were just wrong to say at the time. I don't know, has anyone ever had that weird thing? Okay, thank you. I'm glad I'm not the only one in the room with that. And so I had to begin to manage that. I had to think, okay, listen, you're just real happy and excited right now, Melissa, so make sure you watch what you say. Because it's kind of, one of the, I'm one of those people, what comes up comes out, so I have to you know, really taper that. So those are ways that happiness can hijack. So we have to be aware of what these triggers are. And again, anytime you are triggered, just pause. Now, don't be a weirdo if someone tells you a joke and it's funny, laugh. <laughs> don't say, I need a six second pause before my laugh. No, laugh at jokes, but in other <laughs> ways in life, take that pause. What triggers you? You know what it is. You know your top thing your top three things, take 30 seconds. I'll tell y'all what triggers me. The very first thing that triggers me, when someone lies. Boy, do I get triggered. Ooh, getting triggered just thinking about it. All right, take 30 seconds, write down what triggers you. All right, did everybody define at least one trigger? All right, anybody wanna share? Yes, ma'am. Triggered like I'm less than. Mm. Yeah, who else? Yes. I have to repeat myself over and over So someone's not listening to you. Yeah. 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 Yes, ma'am. Oh, tattletelling. Okay. Injustice. Mm, injustice. Yes. Laziness. Mm, laziness. Who else? Anybody else want to share? All right. Oh, yes, ma'am. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those are some valid triggers. Yes. Uh, I've got two that kind of go hand in hand. Uh, you know, back, backing out of uh, previous like, made plans mm. or uh, going back on your word. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Some of mine were already said, but a big one for me is um, not, not accepting accountability and you're blaming others and making excuses for that. That's mm, a big trigger for me. That is. Uh, me too. <laughs> yeah. All right. Those are some valid triggers. All right. Thank you guys for sharing. So we need to remember that these limbic hijackers and other triggers can cause us to make bad decisions, right? Even if we feel justified in them. Even if they are valid triggers, you know, someone talking down to you, people not living up to their word, those are things that people need to be held accountable for. Lying, okay? But we are responsible for how we react to those. And so it's important for us to understand the balance between our rational brain and our emotional brain. And when we are triggered by something, how we're going to respond. All right, that's your responsibility. So emotional intelligence, we've talked about a couple of ways. That we, we defined emotional intelligence in a couple of different ways, but I also wanted to define it like this. It is the ability to understand, use, and manage your own emotions in positive ways to relieve stress, communicate effectively, empathize with others, overcome challenges, and diffuse conflict. And probably so much, so much more. But that was everything that we could fit into right there. You gotta take care of yourself first though. Self-care is a must. What does self-care look like? 
Yes. Um, I look at it like um, talking positive to yourself. Oh, um, yeah. Especially when you're under stress or anytime there's a negative emotion, replace it with a positive emotion. Yeah, exactly. So good talk. Get rid of that trash talk in your head. What else does self-care look like? Yes. Healthy choices. In what ways? All of them. All of them, yeah. What you do when you sleep, all that. All of that. So you got to get rest. You need to recharge. You need to eat. Okay, who else in here is just uh, tends to be kind of a racehorse during the workday and will look up and it's one o'clock and you haven't eaten yet? Yeah, okay. Saying this to myself too, stop it, <laughs> okay? Eat breakfast. Put some kind of nourishment in your body before one o'clock p.m. in the day. You've got to take care of yourself. You have to feed yourself. Get this, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, whatever that looks like for you. Take care of your whole self, okay? If you want to be a leader, if you want to have impact and influence on other people, you got to take care of you first. So self-care is a must. Any questions on that? So let's talk about the five components of EQ. This is from the Emotional Intelligence book by Daniel Goleman. Has anyone read this book? It's a cool book, isn't it? Yeah. So we're going to walk through these five components. Self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy, and social skills. So self-awareness. We've already talked about self-awareness. But just to recap, this is your ability to recognize your own emotions, strengths, and limitations, and how all of that impacts people around you. Okay? Think of the Know Yourself to Lead Yourself tool that you've learned and that you're going to get sent to you. Self-regulation. This allows you to wisely manage your impulses and your emotions. Let's talk about impulses for a minute. This is, this is great to talk about this because we just got done with the holidays. What happens around the holidays? Stressed? What else? Overeating, yeah. There's so much good food to consume. Oh my goodness, so many opportunities and it's like, you know, the food's there on the table and the impulse, impulse to say, okay, yeah, I'm gonna have, you know, all the snack food, I'm gonna eat the, the big ham or turkey or whatever it is you eat. And then yes, we're going in for the pie, the cakes, everything. Yeah, and so, Think of self think of that when you think of self-regulation. So self-regulation is every day though in your life. What impulses are driving you to good decisions and negative decisions? Think about what, what those impulses are. Identify triggers, uh, what triggers you, and then begin to intentionally manage those triggers. Okay? Any questions on self-regulation? Motivation. So before I get into motivation, I want to throw out another word that goes right along with motivation, and that's influence. Does anyone know what influence means? To be influenced by something? Yes, <laughs> very good. Letter changed. Letter changed. Letter changed. Oh, yeah, to be letter changed, another way. Yeah. To be making an impact. To be making an impact? Yeah. All those are good. And I would add that to influence somebody means to inspire action. And who is the first person that you can influence? Yourself. Yourself. So when we're thinking about motivation, I also want you to think about that influence piece to that. Inspiring action with yourself and others. Okay? And so motivation is our internal mechanism that triggers a desire to achieve the goals that we seek to achieve and also really enjoying what we do because when we enjoy what we do we're motivated by that right so some questions to consider what motivates you what are your goals do you have them written down I have this saying if it's not written down it don't get done because that's how it is in my life if I don't write it down, it's not going to happen. 
So my goals have to be written down. Okay, so write your goals down. Think about what motivates you. Think about influence and taking action. Empathy. Empathy is, the, is being able to identify with, relating to, and understanding the emotions of others. Here is what empathy is not. Okay? Empathy is not you are going through something and you tell me, oh, Melissa, you know, I have this going on and I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. All right, I'll see you later. <laughs> that is not empathy, y'all. Okay? Empathy is when someone is sharing something with you that is important to them, that they're going through, you are connecting with that person. You are giving them eye contact, not weird eye contact like that. Yeah, you got to, don't go in too close. But you are listening to them. You are relating as best you can to what they're going to, going through. On that relating note, though, if you haven't gone through what that person's gone through, don't act like you know what they're going through, okay? You can even say, I'm so sorry. I've never been through anything like this before. But what I can tell you is that I'm here for you to help you as best I can, even if that's just to listen, okay? So empathy is truly connecting with somebody in their pain. Now, for people who are not natural empathizers, okay, I am. So if you come to me, you're going to get natural empathy. My husband, and he don't mind me telling this on him, he is not. <laughs> but if you are somebody who is not a natural empathizer, you can develop that tool, okay? Just like I showed you. Just when, when someone's sharing something with you, you can take your pause and really listen to what they're going through. And my husband has developed that over the years. He has developed that empathy tool and he can tune into what someone's saying and listen to them. If he can relate, he will say, I can relate to that. If he cannot, he will say, yeah, I'm sorry you're going through that. I'm here if you need me. All right, so empathy is a big component of emotional intelligence because we're connecting with people in their pain. Any questions on that? Social skills. Social skills is when we're effective at managing relationships that benefit everyone involved. Do y'all know that person that can walk into a room and just kind of blow it up? <laughs> just kind of know social awareness about reading the room, what's going on, and they just come in with their agenda, you know, drop the, the hand grenade and then leave? Yeah. So we need to be able to read a room be socially aware and ask the question too if you are finding that people are scattering away from you every time you show up <laughs> yeah see, yeah, probably not a good thing you're right you probably need to ask the question what's going on here okay go and talk to somebody maybe somebody in that group or close to the group and say hey this is happening every time i show up it really may not be you okay it might be that there's something going on in that group that maybe has something to do with you or doesn't, but it's kind of something that's out of your control. That could be one issue. Or it could be that every time you show up in this group, you're not reading the room and you might be offending people in some way. Okay? So we have to have social awareness. We have to know the appropriate way to act in different settings. We have to know the appropriate timing to have conversations, okay? Um, having a personal conversation in the middle of a staff meeting with somebody you manage is not the appropriate time, right? Or if somebody's walking out the door, headed home, that's not always the right time to have a tough conversation. So we have to have that appropriateness, that, those social skills. Any questions on that? So let's just hover here for a second and talk about why emotional intelligence is so important. Obviously, you all think it's important because you're all here this morning. But here are some other things to consider that impact, uh, that emotional intelligence have an impact on. It is the foundation of critical thinking, particularly in the workplace. 
If we can make emotionally intelligent decisions while we are working on our critical thinking, then that will lead to better results, okay? If we're making those important decisions based on our emotions and what triggers us, probably not gonna have good outcomes. In the workplace, it optimizes our energy because if people are not being triggered all throughout the workplace and then we have all this conflict and fallout that we have to deal with, if that's not happening, then guess what? We've got positive energy going on in the workplace. It empowers us because when we begin working on ourselves and we begin making those good choices when we're emotionally triggered and we say, you know, we take that pause and we say, all right, thinking brain, how are we going to deal with this? We make good choices. We feel better about ourselves, right? And we're dealing with less stress. We're dealing with less fallout. So we are empowered as individuals and it even engages an organization. All right. Any questions on that? So I want you all to think of a time when having an emotional intelligence helped you. And if no one has a story they want to share, I have one I can share, but I would love to hear from you all. Does anyone have a story of the time when emotional, having emotional intelligence helped them? Yes. Okay. Mm. But I didn't even know I had. I'm just, I'm just thinking. Mm. And to make sure that I, what's going to come out is positive for them. Mm. That's a good point. So I don't know if everyone heard him. Sorry, what's your name? Lance. Lance. If everyone heard Lance, uh, but he was talking about how it, it happens every day when he's talking with the people that he manages. But he didn't realize that he has this red face sometimes when he's talking to people and he's just thinking okay and so I actually had the same thing happen to me many years ago and when I worked at the chamber and there's a story that I, I tell about it in another workshop called the angry manager but my team thought I was angry in every meeting because my thinking face looks really mean and I didn't know that and so we were working through this um, project and so we were having these t staff meetings, and I wouldn't say they were intense, but they required a lot of thought. And I had a great team, I loved my team. But we would get in these meetings and I just went in my thinking mode. And so finally, after one of the meetings, uh, one of the staff members came to me and said, can I talk to you? She looked a little bit apprehensive and I thought, what is going on here? I was like, yeah, and she closed the door. She said, are you mad? No, I'm not mad. Why do you think I'm mad? She said, well, everyone thinks you're mad because when we get in these meetings, you just look really angry. <laughs> and I wasn't. And I, I, I started chuckling, not at her, but just at the thought. And I said, oh, my gosh, that's my thinking face. And I'm so sorry. I said, I'm going to start working on that. But I praised her for coming to me and telling me that. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known. I had no idea. And so... I immediately called my whole team in my office and said, guys, like this was just revealed to me and here's what I want you all to know about me. I am not angry. I think y'all are doing a great job. When you see me looking like that, I really am thinking. And then I went further and said, when I am angry, this is what I look like. And I, I said, and actually I, I said, when, if you see me get really quiet and pull back, that's a good sign I'm angry. So I told them, this is what it looks like. But yeah, that's interesting that that happens to you as well. Anybody else want to share a time emotional intelligence helped them? Yes? On a more positive note, on the empathy thing, I worked at a funeral home for six years. Oh, wow. Um, and this woman, I don't know why we made a connection. We were always taught to never say, even if you've lost someone, you can never understand someone else's pain. So you always say, I can't imagine what you're going through. That must be very difficult for you made a connection with this woman. Um, it sounds a little odd, but her daughter always wore a push-up bra, and the 
the person who dressed her did not remember to put it on. And so I helped her put it on. And then um, every year on the anniversary of her daughter's death, she would come and take me out to lunch. And we would just have a nice day remembering her daughter. It was really wow. Awesome. wow. That's a huge impact. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else want to share? Okay. Let's see. Quickly, I'll share uh, my emotional intelligence story. So uh, about a year and a half ago, I had a conference to attend um, in the central uh, states, and I was going by myself. No big deal. I don't mind traveling by myself, but I knew nobody at this conference. I had not met anybody. Now, I am a somewhat social person, okay, which I love interacting with people. Obviously, I have a passion for helping people, uh, but I am not a social butterfly, particularly if you get me in a room with a bunch of people I don't know. So I knew this about myself, and so I thought ahead, and I thought, okay, this, uh, it was going to be an afternoon that we were going to have this mixer the first time we were all going to get together. And I thought, all right, Melissa, you can't be a wallflower. Like, you need to go in there, you need to manage this about yourself, and you need to try to connect with people. So I told myself, all right, you're going to try three different people to connect with. If you strike out, then you'll figure out what to do then. Because my first thought was, well, if I strike out, I'm running back to my hotel room, and I'm going to stay in there the rest of the conference because I'm my own boss, so I would be the one to have to answer to myself, and it was my money. So, you know, I thought this would be so easy just to not let this work, right? So I thought, no, I'm going to hold myself accountable, and I'm going to manage myself with this, this thing. I get to the mixer, and... Uh, there were people there greeting. It was that part was great, and I thought, oh, okay, I'm not gonna have to deal with any of that. No, that wasn't the case. So, go up to the first person. There was a group of people, introduce myself, and just kind of got the mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm really gonna have to do this. Strike one. Go up to the next group of people. Somebody I had met. I had actually met somebody. Um, on a virtual call prior to this. Go up to this person, hey, hi, you remember me? Hi, how are you doing? And they were talking to a group of people and they said, hi, how are you? Strike two. I'm like, ooh, I'm leaving right now. I thought, okay, Melissa, you can do this. You can connect with somebody in this room. So go up to uh, this other person, look like just, you know, I thought, this person looks super friendly. They're going to talk with me. Walk up. Hi, I'm listening. And, uh, hi, how are you? Yeah, nice to meet you. Boom. I struck out, y'all. And I stood there and I thought, and I'm literally standing, looking at this person's back. Like, they literally just kind of turned. I was like, okay, what are you going to do, big girl? How are you going to react to this? Are you just going to go back to your hotel room and say you had your plan, you struck out? Are you going to stand your ground and stand in this room and figure this out? And I thought, I asked myself in that moment, what do I need? What do I need right now? And I thought, I just need to take a breath. I just need to take a pause. So there were tables in the room because we were having a mixer in the same room that we were all going to then go into like a, a conference situation. So I love sitting in the back of the room. Um, so I went to a table in the back of the room and sat down, opened up uh, my phone because I had very important emails to read in that moment. No, I just, you know, needed to look like I had something I needed to do, right? So I'm buried in my phone, not looking at anything really, but just trying to figure out, what am I going to do? Like, this feels really uncomfortable. I haven't been able to connect with anyone in this room. And so all the start, thoughts start flooding in. And I stopped him. I said, no, no, you're here for a reason. You're here for good. You're here to grow and to develop and to meet people. And that will happen. So I just had to pull back from all that. I look up and there's this precious dear lady standing in front of me. And she said, hi, my name is, and, and we'll just say her name was Jane. She says, my name is Jane. Are you new here? Is this your first time? 
And I said, yes, it is. She said, I looked in the back of the room and I saw you sitting back there and thought, you must not know anyone. Can I sit down with you and we can get to know each other? She's precious to me. Precious, precious, precious. So she sat down, we started talking, started getting to know each other. And then she began introducing me to everybody and it was like everything changed. So, wow. What I had wanted to happen, the way I wanted things to happen, didn't happen. I gained so much more from just thinking through, th being proactive, right? Being intentional about how am I going to manage myself in this situation. And it all worked out. And yes, I struck out. <laughs> but that's okay. Sweet little Jane came and we made friends and, and I did uh, meet new people. So that was the time having emotional intelligence happen for me. The impact was not what just happened there that day, but it also taught me that I really can manage this thing. I really can manage my triggers and my tendencies. Any questions on that? All right. The side effects of emotional intelligence, an increased personal well-being, Decreased occupational stress. Why would that be? Yeah. And what else? Somebody said something over here. Yeah, you learn how to manage it so you're not dealing with a bunch of conflict and fallout, right? Redu reduce staff turnover. Improve decision making. Increase leadership ability. Increase team performance. And we can go on and on and on and on. Okay. Let's look at some practical applications of emotional intelligence in the workplace. Okay, so let's just put some legs on this and what, is this, what could this look like in the workplace? So I'm going to throw out some words here and then some questions that will hopefully inspire some thought for you. I might have answers to some of these questions and I may not because they're really just for you to consider, take back to your company and think, can we make this work anywhere? Okay, so how could we observe emotional intelligence in the workplace? What does it look like from an individual, relational, and group standpoint? On some of these questions, you can also, if, if you're struggling to think, well, what does that look like? Do the reverse, do the negative and say, well, here's what it doesn't look like, okay? It sure doesn't look like this. If you have to start there, start there. Where does emotional intelligence naturally occur in our organization? I'd like to throw out a challenge question to you all. Where should it occur to begin with in an organization? At the top. At the top. It all starts with leadership, right? Who seems to have a clear understanding of emotional intelligence? So those are some ways you can observe. I'm sorry, what did you think? Leaders and managers. Absolutely. They should, right? Measure. So this is an intangible. It's hard to measure intangibles. But believe it or not, there are ways that emotional intelligence can be measured. So ask the question, how might we measure this? And if you need to flip around and go to the negative and say, well, what are some ways that we know we are not going to measure emotional <laughs> intelligence? Or you can say, what are some things we need to improve on? We can measure that improvement okay what metrics can be tied to emotional intelligence maybe you don't have any and that's okay who is performing individually while also leading a balanced life so who's setting a good example for having emotional intelligence where does the company benefit from having high emotional intelligence Okay, so those are questions we can ask about measuring it. Emphasize. So how could we emphasize emotional intelligence? How do we brand involve emotional intelligence in our cultural and branding? Can it be branded in our, in our workplace culture? I would say the answer is probably yes, it could be. What things do we need to talk about most? 
when and where should we be discussing emotional intelligence? Now, I want to just stop right here on this because some people think that emotion should not be discussed in the workplace. Has anyone ever heard that before? Emotion should not be... Okay, so let me ask you this. I would say this is a professional setting. Would everybody agree with that? We're all business professionals. Has anything been extremely weird or uncomfortable that we've talked about so far this morning and talking about emotional intelligence? Does anything seem inappropriate for work? If it does, I mean, say it. I want to hear it, but okay. So it's okay to talk about emotions in work, isn't it? And it's also beneficial, and it's also necessary. So there are times and places, though, to discuss that. Reinforce. So how can we reinforce emotional intelligence? And could we have any rewards for emotional intelligence, and what does that look like? First thing I would say is, you know, look at your, your personal um, and professional development skill programs. What do you all have in place there? What are the natural and designed consequences of low emotional intelligence? Are there consequences for when somebody does act out? What behaviors and results will naturally result in a high EQ? So what particular behaviors are we looking for here? And then adapt. How can we adapt our EQ st strategies? If this is something that you are already working on in your workplace, do some things need to change? What should we start doing, stop doing, keep doing the same, and what should we keep doing but we need to change the way that we do it? All right. Any questions on that? I have a comment. Yes, please. So I was previously working in an organization and one of the things that uh, I needed to change was when things went great, we understood why, <coughs> why things went well. When things did not go well, we understood why they did not go well. So we started a routine of after action reviews. Mm. So if an employee was injured, if there was a power outage that affected <coughs> operations, those kinds of things, and we had a routine bi weekly review of all those things. And very quick, it's a checklist. We ran a checklist of what we would discuss, and we added an element that's the exact same thing. We, mm. we had a different name, we call it leadership and action. Mm -hmm. So we reviewed our personal interactions and how folks' personalities and their interactions with each other influence the outcome of an event. Hmm. Um, so this would be a real easy thing to add to an after-action review. If things go great, you had a great quarter on profitability or whatever it happens to be. If, if the, you had a vehicle accident, uh, whatever add the emotional intelligence review mm -hmm. and ask yourself and those that were involved, how did emotional intelligence affect the outcome of the, uh, that yeah. incident or, or circumstance? That's a great strategy because we can always learn from failures and mistakes, can't we? Probably the best time to learn. Yeah, thank you for that. And it, it did tip the scales early on. We were just looking at the physical things. Did mm -hmm. we have repair parts on hand? Other, the other non, uh, the other tangible assets that you can have. That's cool. <coughs> but it didn't happen right away, you said. It just, no, as you. Time. But there was a lot of peer pressure later on because folks would feel pressure to, to use good emotional intelligence because they knew they were going to have to talk about it with their peers after mm -hmm. it was over. That's cool. Thank you for sharing that. All righty. So emotional intelligence can be a vague concept if our path forward is not clearly defined. And so we need to consider what it looks like to apply emotional intelligence principles in an organization. So we're going to run through these principles. Critical thinking. So we already talked about 
how critical thinking is foundation and having emotional intelligence is the foundation to critical thinking. And so our thinking is governed by two things, our intelligence and our emotions. And unless we're aware of how it affects our ability to reason, it would be really hard to develop those critical thinking skills, okay? So critical thinking. Optimizing energy. So energy management is all about paying attention to the physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional elements of our everyday lives. Everything is connected. And how can we maximize our potential by optimizing our energy? And remember that it has an impact, not just on you, but on everyone around you. Empowering individuals. People want to feel like they have some control in their lives. And yes, even in their work. So it's important that we provide autonomy to our employees. Give them some decision-making abilities, okay? One of the worst things for somebody to feel at work is just to be frustrated about their experience and not really understand why. And then there's emotions about it that they don't understand why they're having these emotions, what's causing it, okay? So if we don't have healthy systems put in place to have conversations with our employees, we can't be even begin to understand these things. And so we might have an employee acting out and we just have no idea. We're like, this person's a pretty high performer, seem like a pretty solid person, all of a sudden they're acting out. Well, if we're not having intentional, consistent conversations and giving them the chance to talk about what their work experience is like, we're not gonna know this. We wanna empower our individual, our people. We wanna be an engaging organization. So an engaging organization is engaged in daily activities, okay? And they're pretty good at getting talented people to focus on the right things in the organization. The biggest distraction that people face at work is their own emotions. I don't know about some of you all, but as I was growing up in the workplace, and this was many years ago, I was told, you leave your personal life at home. Has anyone ever heard that in their career? Well, for me, in my practical, somewhat odd way of thinking, my response was, but I'm everywhere I go. <laughs> You're everywhere you go. So that means what's going on personally with you, you know, work life, everything that you have going on, it goes with you. And yes, you have to uh, conduct yourself in appropriate manners, but all that stuff is with you. And everyone's going through something, right? Everyone. So you can't just keep the personal at home. And I think the, the workplace has evolved in that thinking. I think that's definitely changed but it's still something that we have to keep front of mind and be int intentional about, is that we have real live human beings who are feeling emotions, who are going through things, working in our companies, okay? And they feel just like we feel. They go through feelings and emotions, and again, they have things that they're going through. Some in, con in their control, some not. And so we gotta manage emotions in workplace, in the workplace and be that engaging organization. So we're gonna stop here for just a couple minutes. Um, I'm actually just gonna take a minute on this so I can manage time. I want you to think about the wisest person that you know. And what is it about them that makes them seem wise to you? And how are they different from you? How are they the same? So we're going to take 60 seconds, and I want you to answer these questions if you can. You may not think of somebody right away, but I want you to remember this person because they're going to be your emotionally intelligent uh, role model person. Okay, There are many, many people in my life that are wise people, but as far as emotional intelligence goes, my father-in-law, who's no longer with us, he is the one that really taught, began to teach me about emotional intelligence and just kind of calming down. <laughs> when things were happening. So take 60 seconds and think about that.
Has anyone been able to think of somebody that they want to share? No? Yes, ma'am. Mm. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing. Has everyone had a chance to think about somebody? All right. So remember that person. I really want you to think about what it is. What impact have they had on you? And how can you take that and maybe use that in your own life? So emotional intelligence is really not about intelligence at all, you guys. It's about wisdom. <coughs> It's about learning. It's about having life experiences. That's why we have this tendency to, when we're learning from somebody, we tend to go to people that are older than us, right? They've been through more stuff. We haven't. We don't know what we don't know. We don't know how we're going to react to things that we've never imagined we would encounter before. So emotional intelligence is truly about wisdom, <clears throat> and I would say always learning, learning every day. So let's talk about some things we can start, stop, keep, and change. I'm going to run through these pretty quickly because then we're going to go back to that leader mirror and then give you guys a few minutes to respond to your answers earlier. Okay? So these are just suggestions of things that you can start, stop, keep, and change. So start thinking about common, defining common words and phrases clearly in the workplace. Okay? Having regular discussions about emotional intelligence. Hiring team members who believe in the power of, of being wise, let's say. Training people on the concepts of emotional intelligence. And again, I will go back to, we're going through a training on emotional intelligence. Is it weird and inappropriate for the workplace? No. We can talk about these things. Some things to consider stopping. Focusing only on performance measures. Okay, numbers are good. We need to hit goals. The bottom line matters, but it's not the whole story. There's so much more going on that impacts that bottom line. And our personal development, professional development, skill development, all of that impacts the bottom line. So let's not focus only on performance measures. Let's not be distant from employees. This one stands out to me. Let's not assume that people are skilled at balancing their work and their life. Let's not think, well, I got it under control. Everyone else can figure it out or they got it figured out. We don't know that. Let's talk about it. Let's make sure that people know what they need to know. Oops, missed one. And then believing that there's weakness in the emotional side of business. No, actually, there's strength. When we can be emotionally intelligent, go back to that critical thinking, we can make better decisions that will lead to better outcomes and success. Some things to keep doing. Keep holding your people to a high standard, okay? Train them on skill development. Fill needed roles with people who fit the company culture. Has anyone ever worked at a company uh, that their, the culture was just not a good fit for you? Has that ever happened? You know, not that it's a bad company, but if you don't fit the culture, it's going to be really, really hard to do well at your job. So let's try to, to hire people that will fit the company culture. And then let's keep adjusting to the needs of the, the marketing in our industries. Some things to consider changing. The way we promote people into leadership. Just because someone has worked in a job for 10 years, based on that alone, that's... We, we, should, we don't need to promote them, right? We would need to look at people in a different way and think, okay, 
Yes, they've worked at this job at 10 years. What have they done in this job? How have they grown in 10 years? And then when we put people into leadership, let's help them out, right? Let's give them the tools and skills uh, development that they need to manage people. A couple years ago, I was coaching somebody who had been a manager for eight years at this point. I could see the pain in their eyes, in their face as we talked. And I asked the question, now remember, they'd been a manager for eight years. I asked them, how much leadership development have you had? Do you want to know what their answer was? Zero, a big fat zero. Oh, I empathize with them in that moment. Felt so bad. You know, we have to equip our managers. Anybody that's a leader at any, at any point, and I would argue that everybody's a leader, we have to give them the tools that they need to lead. How we set individual team and team and whole company goals, how we show people appreciation, okay? It's not always just a pat on the back, or maybe that is just what's needed, okay? And then the way that we define success in business. Is it all about the bottom line? Or are there other things that matter too? Any questions on that? Ran through that pretty quick. So think about some things that you're going to start, stop, keep, and change. What can you begin to, to do there? Okay, back to the leader mirror. So here's what I'd like for you to do. The top of your page there, the answers that you gave, it's good to know and be aware of what it's like to be on the other side of you. If you're being proactive, reactive, consistent, inconsistent, intentional, or accidental. Okay, it's, it's good to say, yeah, I'm this or that. It's even better to tie some action to that knowledge. So we don't have to do that right now in this room, but I want to inspire some action in you, okay? And say to you, I want, to, want you to consider what are some things I can begin doing to change this. If you find that you're more inconsistent, what are some it's small ways that you can begin to be consistent. It's that simple. We have a saying um, at Clearly Your Group, we say the slow way is the fast way. So when you're climbing a mountain, do you stand at the bottom of the mountain and take one giant leap and you're up at the top of the mountain? No, okay? I don't know anyone that could do that. You begin walking, right? You take small steps. And depending on where you're at in the mountain and if it's real rocky, you might have to take some very, very small and intentional and use some critical thinking. That's what this looks like, guys. Okay, sometimes when we're, I'm doing these exercises with people, they get frustrated because the answer don't come to them immediately and they're like, well, I know I have this behavior, but I don't know how to do it. It's okay. The first thing is being aware of it. The answer will come to you, but begin working on that answer. So if you don't get the answer right now, it's all right. You've already begun the journey. So let's take two minutes, and here are, here's what you're going to ask yourself. What actions can you tie to your answers? The answers are down there at the bottom, and you have them on your page. And then what small things can you start doing today that will begin changing your behavior? Any questions? Okay, so we're going to take two minutes, and then we'll wrap up. All righty. So here's what it boils down to in a nutshell, just to simplify it. You want to start acting like the person that you want to be. So I want you to think about the person that you want to be. I just had to do this with myself this weekend when I was just being <laughs> extremely lazy. Nothing wrong with resting, but I had had plenty of rest at this point, and I really did not want to get up and go uh, run on the treadmill at the gym. I just don't like running on the treadmill. But I, I had to think through to when the weather's warmer, to the beautiful park that I go and run at, and thought, I want, I want my running game to be pretty good whenever it turns warm. So I had to think, okay, that's the person I want to be a few months down the road. So Melissa, get up, get your gym clothes on, 
get your tennis shoes on and get down to that gym. And I did. I had to act in that moment like the person that I wanted to be a couple months down the road. So start acting like you want to be. That might help you get to some of your answers. Any questions? All right. Closing thoughts. Remember, give yourself six seconds to process emotions before them. Don't act like a weirdo when you're doing it, okay? Gave you some, some clues there as to what you could do. Know yourself to lead yourself. Practice self-care, I would say daily. Be self and others aware. Think about how your emotional intelligence is impacting other people. And you can think positively too. It doesn't have to be just negative. Think about things you can start, stop, keep, and change. And then start acting like the person that you want to be. Last closing thought. I want to close out with what I started because I think it's so impactful and sums it up so good. Every time someone loves themselves better, builds their self-awareness, understands their patterns, improves their ability to communicate, and expands their compassion for others, the future of humanity grows brighter. Your healing impacts the world by bringing new peace. And again, young Pueblo, Pueblo said that. Any questions for me? Comments? Was this helpful? All right. Thank you guys. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we do have your HRCI credits. If you're somebody that needs those, we'll put them um, on the table on your way. Or actually, we'll just leave them up here. We'll set them up here. Um, and then you also have the schedule for the year for Success in 90. So we hope to see you guys back here next month. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.